the volume causes an accumulation of fluid, and then even though the heart is, is increasing its thickness, for some reason the volume is so great that it starts to stretch the sarcomeres. And then what happens when the sarcomere length goes to shit? And there's no overlap, no contraction. And that's called um, dilated cardiomyopathy. That's when the heart no longer, it's just like a bag with no ability to contract. More like a vein in an artery. Make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. It does, doesn't it? Because there's a limit to how far I can stretch. And if every one of those cardiac myocytes, if I stretch every one of those, sarc sarc those uh, sarcomere lengths, so that actin and, there's no overlap between actin and myosin, and the heart can't can't contract, and that's called that's called heart heart failure, guys. <laughs> that's what heart failure is. The heart's inability to contract would lead to a massive accumulation of fluid. And what did we say, guys? If fluid stays static, what would we get? Coagulation. Status of fluid in the tube. I don't care where it's at. It's in the heart, or the arteries, or the veins, in the capillaries. I don't care. Doesn't matter. You got me? You're going to increase risk for coagulation. You already got calcium present, don't you? So you don't want stasis of blood. You do not want stasis of blood. Remember stasis of blood? Down here, a lady, she goes on a flight to visit her grandkids out in California. She's on a five hour flight. She gets off. A six hour flight, she gets off. They rush into the hospital. She dies. What she had? Deep main thrombosis. The time that she was sitting, it broke off and went right to the lung. It was a sad lungism. At rest, we use just the base of our lungs, guys. So if I throw a big enough blood clot from my veins to my lungs and I, and I block a zone, a whole lower zone, functional zone of the lungs on either side, then I, I'm down to 50% O2 saturation rate, guys. You get me? If it's big enough and I block the whole one, one of the two lungs, I'm screwed. Huh? Screwed. They call that up. DVT is deep vein thrombosis. Okay? So that's another one you should look at. Deep vein thrombosis. So you got the concentric cardio hypertrophy, you got dilated cardiomyopathy. They call that the cardiac cardiomyopathy. Again, just the basics, guys. Just the basics. Dilated cardiomyopathy, that's when it gets overstretched. Concentric cardio hypertrophy, that's when you get it. There's a physiological exercise, does this. But it's not to such a great extent that it takes over the volume. You hear me? This is all diseases that lead to failure. You got me? Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we say a DVT, which is deep vein thrombosis. Guys. Okay? Deep vein thrombosis can lead to a, a pulmonary embolism. All right? and, uh, and ultimately, death. If it's big enough, what they call a saddle embolism. It's so big it goes in and blocks a whole function of lung. All right. Now remember, at rest we're only, we're only using the lower parts, the base of our lungs. Nothing more, nothing less than that. When we exercise, then we start using more of our lungs physiologically. Does that make sense? It does, doesn't it? Because the heart is going to get more blood. That means the heart is going to push out more blood, which means that more blood the heart pushes out, the more of the lung parenchyma you're going to use to oxygenate that blood. It's called perfusion. It's called a VQ match, match matching. Ventilation versus perfusion. <clears throat> Ventilation versus perfusion. And, and this is how we, so the lungs will increase their ventilation when the heart, when the right side heart increases the amount of blood it kicks out called perfusion. So the lung has the ability to respond. The more blood it gets, then the more it works. That makes sense, doesn't it? Thank God, right, that we have a reserve in the lung. Because what if I have disease of the lung, right? I pick on my, my, my South American right, brethren and Africans, right? What's one of the things that you could get by getting coughed on in the Caribbean, like my friend? TB. Tuberculosis. He was on a bus, he got coughed on, he got TB. How do you know he got it? Oh, because he didn't have it before he got coughed on. And when he went to the doctors a couple weeks later, he got diagnosed with TB. He said, oh, you got exposed to TB. Hmm. The TB affects the lungs, function of the lungs itself. So if you see some of these people coming from the Caribbean or South America, they get, they get TB. 
there's function of the lungs that aren't going to work. Part of the lung aren't going to work. So you think that they can exercise regularly or normally? No, because they're going to have problems matching out. There's all kinds of diseases, guys. Everything from chronic smokers cough to asthma, huh? all kinds of things. We're not there yet. But understand that if there's a disease of the lung, it's going to directly affect the heart's ability to deliver, let alone what? The heart's ability to get fed because, sure enough, as much as the heart would like to steal oxygen away, it cannot. So what does it do? Right where the valves are, the aortic arch, which is the semilunar valve, the aortic semilunar valve, you have the two main coronary arteries coming right on. And they'll come down, and this one will feed the anterior ventricular wall, and this one will come around, snake over, and feed the junction between the left ventricle and the left atrium. That's the, this would be the left coronary artery. Then, the right coronary artery, since we already have the anterior septal wall being fed, doesn't care. It's going to branch off into marginal branches, and it's going to go, it's going to feed here, and then it's going to start descending down. And it's going to come on the back side of the wall. So it's going to sneak around and come on the back side of the wall. See that, guys? So the right side coronary artery is feeding the back aspect of the ventricular wall between left and right ventricle. And the anterior part of the ventricular, uh, ventricular wall, into ventricular wall, is being serviced by the left corner of the artery. All right, now, great, great day. This is how I get blood out, all right? So you got, they call this one the anterior, anterior descending coronary artery. And it's interventricular. So they call it the anterior descending interventricular coronary artery, if you want to call it what it really is. But what do they do? They went and called it the, uh, I think they got rid of the descending and they just called it the, I think it's anterior coronary artery, I think. So they called it the ACA, okay? Then the one back here is the posterior. So the one that's feeding the back wall is coming off the right, because this is your right coronary artery. That's going to be, again, the right ventricle, the right atria, branches off to the right atria, comes down and forms the descending, posterior descending, interventricular. See how this is anterior? The other one's posterior, so it's called the posterior descending uh, interventricular coronary artery because it's going to the interventricular wall, but the posterior interventricular wall. So they call it, now they call it posterior descending uh, coronary artery, and for short, they'll call it PDA. Everybody see that? Versus ACA. Now, I can tell you that surgeons don't do this. Anybody who works on the heart doesn't do this. They still call them what they originally called them, <laughs> which is anterior descending intraventricular coronary artery versus posterior descending intraventricular coronary artery. And there are variations in humans. All right, so there's nothing that says it's got to be this way. It just is what it is for the majority of the time. Okay? And that's how you get blood supply. Now, how do I get it back out? Because this is obviously in high energy demand. Everyone agree? So you get your great, your great cardiac vein is right here alongside, and it's huge. Since the left side heart, guys, now check it out. Now that we know we're going to feel. So when everyone agree, our lungs don't work during development. During the nine months that we're in the womb, we're screwed down in mommy's uterus, it's placenta that's really growing. And our lungs are being bathed by the by basically urine that our urinary system is constantly producing. We're not eating anything, so we're not producing fecal material. But we are urinary, urinating. And that's the amniotic fluid that we're urinating. <laughs> Do you understand it? So we're swallowing amniotic fluid constantly and then secreting amniotic fluid constantly. Everybody understand it? That is what it is. If it's not there, then your lungs don't mature. And it's one of the issues with preemies. Is it not long enough in the amniotic fluid for their lungs to develop? So it's necessary for the amniotic fluid to actually develop our lungs. Okay? So everyone agree? Lungs are not functional in fetus, yes? So I'm gonna write it on the board. So in fetus, 
lungs do not function. And if lungs don't function, then I better have the placenta. Does everyone agree? Well, okay. So then what? Wait, I want to let me shoot just before I go on. I just want to shoot up here because I talked about the VQ, which is a ratio of the ventilation per perfusion. And because the lungs are situated in series with each other, okay? I talked about that, so that's to tell you, that's to lead you down a path so you can understand that when you have disease of the lungs, you're gonna have you're gonna have issues with the heart. Okay? It will impact the overall heart and the performance of the heart as well as other tissues. Separately, there's diseases like the dilated cardiomyopathy, where the heart gets overstretched. There's concentric cardiac hypertrophy, which can be physiologically normal response to exercise because of the increase in venous return due to increase in cardiac muscle contractions. And there is a pathology to this as well, which we'll talk about, right? So just watch the videos again. And separately, I talk about muscular dystrophy because dystrophin is required to bind to dystroglycan, which is the main, the main protein that anchors actin to collagen outside the cell. That's why you've got different variations of muscular dystrophy. And if you go and look at those, I'm not gonna expect you to know the differences between them, but it's good to know, guys. Trust me when I tell you, when you leave here and you take that first semester path, you're gonna thank me. You're like, man, Professor P pushed me really, really hard. I hate him right now, but you're gonna love me later. You're gonna thank me later. Because I'm telling you, all this stuff is coming down the pike, and then some. All right? It's not me who's throwing it at you, it's them. And they're going to expect you to know everything in that book from cover to cover. I just want you to know. You walk up into, <laughs> you walk up into that class, which is Med Surge 1, they're going to expect you to know that book cover to cover. And this is where a lot of my students who contact me to help them get through Med Surge 1, I'm always, every time I meet them, it's always about the basics again. Because it's so much information that they forget. And I have to go and help them remind them as to the overall ability. So separately, I talked about DVTs. Why? Because of one of the diseases of lungs. I'm sorry, one of the things that doesn't have to do with lung directly, but has to do with the blood vessels themselves and stasis. So I didn't write up here, remember, I said stasis. An increase in stasis could increase the risk for DVT. And if the DVT breaks off, the deep vein thrombosis breaks off, goes off into the lung, causes a pulmonary embolism, that can lead to your death. All right? So a lot of, a lot, a lot of diseases. Right? Acid base imbalances, it all the impact. So, all right, so back to this. We did the coronary circulation. Now, for me to get blood back out, I have the great cardiac vein, guys. And then I have the uh, small cardiac vein, or middle cardiac vein, and then there's a small cardiac vein, and they all drain on the backside to the coronary sinus. And then the coronary sinus, guys, amazingly, dumps right into the right atrium. So the heart gets its blood supply from two arteries that are the first branches. Everybody listen, because this is going to be a question on the test. I'm going to ask you, what are the first branches off the A order? Now, that's, 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 that, that is a fair question. Because I told you this whole thing is the A order. Yeah? But if we break it down and split it up, and this is ascending A order, and this is the arch, and this is the descending part, and then when it hits the back wall, it becomes thoracic. So if I ask you, what are the first branches off the A order, what's your response? Coronary arteries. If I ask you, what are the first branches of the ascending aorta? What is your response? Coronary arteries. Everybody understand that? Yes. So I can ask that question either way. The answer is still coronary arteries. The first branch of the aorta, guys, are the coronary arteries. That's how important the heart is. It's not going to steal oxygen away from the blood that's coming in and out of the uh, uh, atrium, from the atrium to the ventricles. It's going to wait to get its blood supply, and it gets it when the heart ventricles are. Depolarized, which is the same as what? Sorry, depolarized, repolarized, which is relaxation, guys. Depolarization is contraction. Repolarization is relaxation. Okay? Are there any questions? Any questions at all? Now's the time to ask. Good. So funny, right? I'm gonna be up in the video drinking water. It's like they're making fun of that politician that grabbed a bottle of water. Was it Marco Rubio? They're criticizing the grabbing a bottle of water. All right. So there's some of the diseases here. Um, and then 
you've got your veins, your arteries for the heart itself. And the heart is that important. It's got its first, the first set of blood supplies off that major root are gonna be for the blood, for the heart. Okay? So heart gets first dibs. And sure enough, check it out now. When the heart contract, when the ventricles contract, huh? We said we get we get no we get no feeding of blood from the outside by the blood vessels. But then when it relaxes, it, did everybody hear it? When I relax, air moved in. And that suction is what draws fluid in. So the heart passively fills 85% of the volume in the ventricle during relaxation. Did everybody hear me? I'm gonna write it up there. The ventricle repolarization is the relaxation of the ventricular muscles. But what happens? 85% of what comes into the heart, 85%, right, of what will be in the heart at the end of relaxation, 85% of the volume of blood moves passively from right atrium to, sorry, left atrium to left ventricle. So that means even if the atria doesn't contract, 85% of the fluid that gets into the ventricle went, so here you go, ventricles relaxing. And I'm increasing the volume, which drops the pressure, which allows fluid to move in from the atria. You get me? So as the ventricles relax, they're going to fill to 85% of their total volume. The atrial contraction, this part, the P wave, versus the QRS, sorry, uh, yeah, QRS complex versus T wave. So during the P wave, okay, you got your atrials are relaxed. Well, when, I'm oh, sorry, the contracting. P wave only contributes 15% of total volume in ventricles. Why? Oh, because during relaxation, the ventricles fill passively. Everybody understand it? The ventricles fill passively with blood when they're in relaxation. 85% of the blood that comes into the ventricles is when it's relaxed. It doesn't need the atria to contract to get 85% of its filling. It gets it automatically when Now, what's interesting? Blood will want to come back in if that happens. Do you agree? That's why you have that one-way check valve called the semi lunar valve. That's the second heart sound, or a component of the second heart sound. Because when the ventricle relaxes, blood wants to come from the aorta and the pulmonary trunks back into the left and right ventricles. But they can't because they got one-way check valves that only allow to open this way, so when they go to try to come back down, it catches. Sure enough, when it closes shut, I apologize, it's right underneath. Everybody see that? So when the ventricles relax, blood will move back in, but then the cusps will catch the blood. And, and those openings are literally right there. They're like, like, like little bags that can catch the blood and then feed it to the coronary artery. And the coronary artery, because it's 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 stretched, because the ventricles relax, it will flow. Yes. So in relaxation, the tracheospid bone and the mitral relaxes too. They 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 don't relax. They slap shut. Oh. Relaxes when they're open. That's during ventricular depolarization, because the pressure is generated is higher inside the ventricles than, than their corresponding great vessels, which are the, the pulmonary trunk and the, and the aorta. Remember, pressure for fluid to move, pressure has to be higher in one area of the tube from the other area of the tube, right? So that valve only opens when the pressure is greater on the, on the ventricular side than on the aortic side, if we're talking about the left side. If we're talking about the right side, then it's the pressure generated by the, left vent, uh, the right ventricle versus the pulmonary trunk, you get me? Because they both have outlets. They both have inlets, but they both have outlets. Okay? Which are, you're still confused. Yeah, because I understood that relaxation left 85% of the volume blood. Again, but don't confuse. Remember, we're talking about the blood that's within the ventricle, not the blood that's feeding the ventricle from the coronary arteries. Okay. Don't confuse the two. Okay. 
That volume is the systemic volume that needs to be kicked out every time the heart beats to feed the blood to all the other organs, including itself. Including itself, right? Then out of that volume that gets kicked out of here, it moves from here into here. Then from that, these guys will close shut and fluid will flow. Okay? So it doesn't want to take from that volume any oxygen. It, it tries not to. Although the reality is that the endocardium, which is that, remember I told you everything started with a simple squamous epithelium with a basement membrane? So sure enough, what's the endocardium? Simple squamous epithelium with a basement membrane. <laughs> Everybody got me? Any questions? Remember, it all started with a simple tube. And when we make heart, it becomes cardiac muscle. And when we make, when we get smooth muscle associated with it, it becomes blood vessels. Don't forget, arterioles are high resistance vessels, right? And veins, veins are, are either high or low compliance vessels. They will never, they should never, ever produce resistance like the arterioles. Arterials are designed one way, because on that side, it's high pressure, and we, we're trying to mimic as much pressure as we can to get it down to the capillaries. And venous side, our job is to retain 60% of the fluid, and then upon demand, we can increase the flow. Okay, that's low pressure versus high pressure. Now, let me get to fetal circulation real quick. So watch what happens. Uh, any, any questions on this? Because I'm gonna raise this and draw another heart. Okay. So real quick. So in fetal circulation, oh, my big eraser. So much easier than big eraser. So we feel certain. Your heart's a little different. Because in fetal circulation, so I'm going to draw the blood vessels. Inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, cava, right atria, left atria, right ventricle, left ventricle, okay? So there's the heart. Then we have the great vessels, uh, pulmonary trunk, and behind it, coming up a bit, is the aorta. Now it's interesting because if I ask you at the arch, well, there's a big, there's the brachiocephalic. Trunk. And that, that's going out and then splitting into carotid and subclavian. Why, why this extra little trunk here? Anybody know? Carotid. So this is common carotid. And guys, again, don't don't focus on all the blood vessels, right? Because I'm I'm not gonna. This isn't lab. If it was lab, then you then you worry about me testing you on blood vessels. In lecture, I'm more concerned with you know more of the physiology of the overall cardiovascular system, how it works with right. So I'm not telling you they don't even know the blood vessels, but you really should be being tested on that in lab. I, yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah. Be, I'm I'm talking about the major blood vessels here, which are really important. So what happens in fetal circulation? We already agree, right? That is placenta that's feeding for us. Now, we also know that liver dumps in here. And so if my placenta, which is out here breathing for us, is here, do I want that oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood coming from placenta? Do I want it to go to liver first? No. Yeah, that doesn't work. Everybody understand that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't want that. Yeah. So what happens? The placenta. will skip the liver and go directly into the inferior vena cava. Everybody see that? Now, and this is nutrient, this is O2 rich, nutrient rich blood, guys. O2 rich, nutrient blood. So I skip the liver. Sure enough, what do we call that vessel that allows us to skip the liver? The ductus venosus. Because we know that if we give it to the liver, the liver's gonna take what? Whatever it wants. Because the liver's job is to what? Decide what to do with nutrients. But it's not time yet! Because you still hooked up the placenta. And depending upon the placenta, they do what you need. Because remember, we're not eating anything, are we? No. We're not munching down on Cheerios, right? And all kinds of stuff like that. Right? You know, little by little, you feed, you feed your kids a little at a time to see if they develop allergies and stuff. So what happens? Okay, ductus venosus 
venosus allows us to bypass, so ductus venosus bypasses liver. Ready to follow? Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so we can so we can kind of we can kind of redraw this as kind of like mixed blood all the way up in here. And mixed blood. Now, does everyone agree? Hey, if I go into the right atria, do I want the oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood in here that's mixed, obviously, with venous? Everyone agree? Because you got venous from extremities, eh? head, neck, and arms, versus lower body and legs, yeah? And so it's being mixed. So this is mixed blood in the fetus. Do I want it to go to the right atrium so it goes to the lungs? No, because what do we say? Lungs are not functional, right? Remember, I put up lungs feet in fetal circulation. In fetus, lungs don't function. They're still in development. So what's going to happen? I'm going to figure out a way to take blood from the right atria to the left back to the left atria. Sure enough, uh, I'm going to erase the. Oh no, I got to leave the pulmonary chunk. I'm sorry. I have to leave the pulmonary chunk. But if I write in here left atria, sure enough, guys, there's a passageway that goes through the, the atrial wall. That passageway is called the foramen ovale. Now, it's interesting. Does everyone agree that we said that this has a higher O2 content? So when there's a higher O2 content here, it's really a flap. So if you can imagine, there's, uh, here, I'll draw it down here. So there's the chair. Imagine this flap. And this is right atria, and this is left atria. If pressure is higher on this side during fetal sort of circulation, guys, then what will it do? It'll push the valve open. Everybody see that? And blood will flow from right atria to left atria in fetal circulation. What happens when you take that first breath? Your lungs come online. And for the first time, blood that's flowing into the left atria, it now has a higher oxygen pressure than the right atria because the placenta, but well, we already cut the placenta and you're already out. We already slid out of the vagina. We took that first breath. You don't slide out the vagina with the placenta. You slide out the vagina, we cut the umbilical cord. When we cut the umbilical cord, well, we cut the umbilical cord as soon as you take that first breath. We, we pretty much cut the umbilical cord, period. But we make sure you're taking that first breath before we cut the umbilical cord. That's not true either. We actually cut the umbilical cord and then tip you upside down and give you a little slap in the butt. <gasps> you, take, you take that big first breath and the, and the left atrial pressure rises. Sure enough, what happens when the left atrial pressure goes higher than the right atrial pressure, guys? It slams the valve shut. So the foramen ovale becomes the fossa ovalis when you take your first breath. We all have a hole in our heart. It's not really a hole. It's a hole with a flap. And the flap is open wide because right side pressures are higher than left side pressure. When we're in fetus, when we're low, when we take that first breath, <gasps> pressure changes. <laughs> Slide shut. Make sense? It does. Because we know now that the lungs are working, now we want to kick blood to the lungs. Now what happens? If we're still in fetus, there's still one more bypass we have to talk about. So foramen ovale, guys, by passes lungs and it shunts blood shunts blood from left atria sorry from right atria to left atria this guy sorry this guy ductus venosus bypasses liver so blood is shunted from placenta to inferior vena cava now if, if, if oxygenated blood coming from placenta enters into the right atria and goes into the right ventricle, does everyone agree that I'm going to get kicked out through the pulmonary trunk and go off the lung? And we already said that in fetus, <laughs> lung, lung, lung don't function. So what do we do? Everybody watch. Oh, we have a bypass. It bypasses, uh, I apologize, it's a little shorter. It bypasses, and that bypass is called the ductus 
arteriosis. And that will bypass, so bypasses the lung. Shunting blood from pulmonary trunk to aortic arch. And it's interesting because even though I, if even if I get blood to the aortic arch when the ventricle relaxes, what happens? Blood what will shift downward and pull and get caught by the aortic valve. So we're still going to be able to get blood supply to the coronary arteries and give it to the heart. So guys, there's three bypasses, fetal circulation. First bypass, ductus venosus. Bypasses, liver, shunts blood from placenta to inferior vena cava. The other one, foramen ovale, bypasses lung, shunts blood from right atria to left atria, because lungs aren't working. Remember, why do we do this? Because we don't want liver to get a hold of anything. And reduce the overall oxygen content that we need for systemic circulation. And then sure enough, if any blood comes into the right ventricle and it kicks out into the pulmonary trunk, we're going to bypass it directly into the arch. Guys, the other two major vessels off the archway are your other common carotid, that's your right side, right versus left, and then so, uh, subclavian, which branches off of here, and then you have the descending aorta and then thoracic aorta. Right? And then don't forget, thoracic aorta becomes abdominal aorta, abdominal aorta becomes common iliac arteries. And then you get internal and external. Right? Interesting enough, the thoracic artery, the, the, the thoracic aorta gives all these branches off that feed the ribs. So you'll see all these little branches off there. So look at the main vessels of the heart, and the main vessels up here, and the main vessels down here within the trunk. Keep it within the trunk. Already follow? I mean, should you know the main branches that are coming from here up? Yeah. Should you know the main branches coming from here are going down? Yeah, right? But not, you don't need to know everything, just the major ones, right? The coronary arteries, the uh, electrical physiology, the mechanical event, the cardiac cycle, um, red blood cells, the ABO blood group, right? The RH group, the difference between both donors, who's the donor, the recipient, universal recipient, universal donor type thing. All right. Um, remember, we talked about that disease, hemolytic disease of the newborn from the RH. You should know that. Um, and some of these diseases I talked about, like DVT and uh, 